I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Thomas Jones. Thomas is a PhD student at the University of Reading where he's currently researching invasive plants. There are 17,000 plant species from all over the world currently residing in our gardens here in the UK. A small percentage of these manage to jump the garden fence and survive in the wild, and a smaller percentage still become a problem. But although it's a small percentage that become invasive, anyone who's done battle with Japanese knotweed knows they can be a huge problem. Thomas is working to predict which plants may become a problem in the future using a range of forecasting techniques, coupled with help from gardeners. In order to tell the harmless plants from the troublemakers, Thomas first needs to address the thorny issue of which plants are native to the British Isles. Could you start by defining what is a native plant and what is a non-native? Yeah, so simply, a native species is one which has arrived in the British Isles naturally, and by that I mean hasn't been introduced by humans. So by that definition, it's not necessarily an issue of time, and by extension, a new species, a new native species could arrive tomorrow as wind-borne seed from the continent, perhaps be regarded as a native, a new native species. A non-native species, a non-native plant, is one that has been introduced to the British Isles by the humans, either intentionally as an ornamental plant or perhaps unintentionally. So that's a simple de- uh, defining factor there. So some non-native plants have been here for centuries, and there are notable examples some of these people might be surprised to learn that, that they are in fact non-native. So one example we can look at is the sycamore, a surseed of Platanus, which could have been introduced by the Romans perhaps a bit later in the 1500s. And that's a non-native species by that definition. Another good example is the snowdrop, Calanthus nivalis. For most people is a valued part of the British flora. But again, in fact, is non-native, having been introduced in 1597. So these have been here for centuries but are regarded as non-native. And the important distinction, perhaps, is or an important fact to consider is that non-native species are not defined as having a detrimental ecological impact. Those are slightly different, those we term invasive, and perhaps I can focus on those later on. But the simple distinction there is the mode of introduction having been introduced by humans. And actually, that, that takes me on to my next question, which is, how many new species of plants are we introduced to the UK each year? And of those, how many actually jump the garden fence and become established in the wild? OK, the numbers are, are staggering. Um, obviously, Britain is famous for plant exploration, uh, has been for centuries, which is why we've got non-native plants for, for such a long period. And now, today, perhaps... Almost half of the British flora is composed of non-native species. And the majority of those were introduced originally as ornamental plants, so introduced for horticulture. But if we look at a few numbers, so the Royal Horticulture Society published their plant finder annually, and this is essentially a list of plants available in nurseries in the British Isles. Now, that plant finder contains 78,000 entries. That huge number includes many different cultivars and varieties. If we look at species level, there's 17,000 species, so a huge number. The vast majority of those are still confined to gardens and very popular ornamental plants. But there's, on this subject, there's a very good book called Alien Plants by Clive Stace and Mick Crawley. And there we've got about 1,000 ornamental plants that have escaped the garden fence, if you want, and they're naturalised in the wild. We can look at naturalised species, and by naturalised, I mean plants that have escaped into the wild and they spread, so they, they've got a self-reproducing population. So we've got about 1,000 ornamental plants growing in the wild that you can find on any sort of Sunday walk in the wild in the British Isles. Other species have escaped gardens, but they don't necessarily survive. So they don't necessarily have a self-reproducing population. That could be perhaps they don't survive uh, minimum winter temperatures. So you only find them in the wild because of repeated escapes from gardens. 
some of those could be summer bedding, for example. So French and African marigolds are a good example. I haven't looked at these two species in doing my PhD, but I remember planting these with my granddad as a child. Popular bedding, summer bedding, but you only find them in the wild and because of repeated reintroductions or escapes. Of the ones that are able to reproduce of their own accord, yeah. would you class all of those as invasives? No. A very small number of those. And that, that's perhaps the main point when we're distinguishing between non-native and invasive. So I said there were approximately a thousand naturalized ornamental plants in the wild. It's a relatively small number of those that have become invasive. I would say the numbers differ depending on your source. But if we go look back at the um, Alien Plants book, approximately 60 species are regarded as two invasives. So it's a relatively small number. Now, invasive species are one of the main threats to biodiversity, both globally and the British Isles. So although it's a relatively small number, it's by no means a small problem. Um, but the emphasis is that although we have perhaps 78,000 different plants growing in our gardens, it's a very small proportion that have a, that are invasive. And by invasive, I mean having a detrimental ecological impact or economic impact. So having that noticeable impact on, on native biodiversity. Right. So just because a plant isn't classed as invasive, could it still cause problems by occupying a niche that would otherwise be taken up by a native plant? Yeah, arguably, yes, of course. Um, any non-native plant is filling a niche or, or, or space that would otherwise be occupied by a native species. Um, I think it's difficult to argue against that point. But here I would perhaps argue for a degree of pragmatism only because of the, the, the vast number of non-native ornamental plants we already have. So perhaps we need to focus our attention on those species that have a, a noticeable detrimental impact on native biodiversity because uh, many of the non-invasive ornamental species do provide ecosystem services. We might get back to this later. So many of them might have positive impacts. It's not all about negative impacts where we're, when we're looking at the invasive species. So I would argue for a degree of pragmatism, um, especially in the context of limited resources for conservation efforts and so on. Mm -hmm. I think we probably all know about things like Japanese knotweed, but of giving a broad overview of the 60 invasive plants that, that you're concerned with, what kind of things are they doing that is causing such trouble? So an invasive not ornamental plant might compete against a native plant for resources. Uh, we could look at light, for example, one of the invasive species that I've been looking at is giant rhubarb, uh, Genoa species, either Genoa tinctoria or Genoa manicata from South America. As the common name suggests, giant rhubarb, these are huge rhubarb-looking plants, very popular ornamental plants if you've got a big enough garden for them, often planted along the edge of a pond or a stream. If they've got the correct conditions, they're invasive in parts of Ireland, for example. If they have the correct conditions, you can ha essentially have a forest of, of this plant and the leaves can grow up to two meters in diameter. So underneath, you've got very little um, light for the other plants. Uh, that's one factor. Obviously, invasive species can change the biochemistry of the soil also. The pests and diseases is a very important point, but that's separate to my PhD. So they can have a negative impact in a, a very different ways. And it can sometimes be difficult to, to measure the, the extent of that impact. I thought it was interesting what you said about the non-native plants who, who aren't invasive yeah. actually providing a benefit some, occasionally, sometimes. Is that that they provide a benefit just in terms of providing nectar and pollen or can they also be useful as a host species to certain wildlife species? Yes, so the RHS have done some work on this um, as part of their Plants for Bugs project, where they were comparing ornamental species with native species, plant species, and their importance for insects and invertebrates. So, of course, ornamental plants can provide additional habitats, for example, 
uh, you mentioned uh, they can uh, provide resources for pollinators also. Such factors might be very important in the context of climate change. So if you're looking at changing phenology, for example, ornamental plants as a resource for pollinators could become more important. Perhaps the conclusion for the RHS project was that insects and invertebrates might prefer native species, but ornamental plants have a role in providing habitats and additional resources. Um, Again, if we're looking at pollinators, having a mix in your garden of native and non-native plants, it does extend the flowering season, for example. So the conclusion would be perhaps native native species are better for insects, invertebrates and so on, but there's no harm in having those additional resources uh, provided by ornamental plants. Uh, So I would argue for a a nice mix in the garden of native and non-native plants. Mm. Yeah, obviously that was just looking at the garden. Um, I'm think I guess I'm thinking of more about things that have naturalised in the wild environment. Yeah. Um, I think maybe that RHS study. I did have some issues with it. I thought it was slightly disingenuous because they did. I think downplay the importance of the native plants in the conclusions that they put out in the press um, because it, they did actually say that it was you know, it it was proven that the native plants were preferable, but they did only look at pollinators. They didn't look at the plants as host species for, for biodiversity. So again, I think in a garden setting, yes, it's great to have a mixture in the wild. Perhaps I, I don't think that you could argue that I don't think you can conclusively argue that the non-natives that have naturalised are doing as good a job because they didn't look look at them as food plants. Um, And that was a bit of an issue with that. I I totally agree. In in the wild, of course, um, native species are better um, than non-native species because in terms of interactions between pollinators or invertebrates and plants, these interactions are uh, are the result of a huge amount of time and although at the very beginning I mentioned that some of these naturalized plants have been here for centuries that's such a, a short time span when we're looking at the whole ecological process or ecological system in the wild so when we're looking at on naturalized ornamental plants in the wild my focus would be on measuring to what extent they've got a negative impact rather than on what extent they've got a positive impact so that we can distinguish between the two invasive species and then perhaps we can categorize naturalized non-native ornamentals as benign perhaps, not having a noticeable negative impact and there's still work to be done on, on what extent they have a positive impact. Yeah, so excuse my ignorance with anything to do with science, but I'm guessing that part of your work would be to take a patch that was purely natives and then some that were naturalized plants and then some invasives and compare those yes that would that would be one approach sadly i I don't work in the field i'm 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 behind the beautiful computer but one 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 way of measuring the the impact or the comparable impact of native and non-native species for biodiversity would be yes um, a field experiment where you've got a purely non-native plot and then i would argue also to have a mixture, because in the wild they, they are not separated; they they do interact, and and for the most part, perhaps um, uh, coexist. Um, so it would also be interesting to measure their relative performance as a mixed stand of native and non-native plants. Um, so thinking about it in terms of the garden again. Yeah. Obviously, you said that there's 78,000 species that we have in this country now, as pl- according to the RHS. I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. We seem to have quite an obsession for the new and the novel in, when we look at plants. Um, but do you think that there should be tighter controls on the importation of plants into the UK because we just don't know what we're bringing in? It's a very difficult question to answer. Um Legislation certainly has an important role and it's an important mechanism in terms of controlling plant introductions. So for us in the UK, uh, if we're looking at invasive species that have been introduced, these fall under Schedule 9 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but also the EU regulation on invasive alien species. And I cannot say how that legislation will, will develop given the political context we're in. But 
lethal mechanisms such as those are important in banning species that we know are invasive. My particular interest here, and it has the same goal as types of controls on importation, is public awareness of the problem. Perhaps it's a softer approach, but has the same goal of controlling potentially invasive species. And that's raising public awareness of the impact they can have. And for invasive plants, of course, gardeners are crucial in that. Yes, it definitely would be a great thing for people to understand about the plants they're bringing in and to take responsibility because, as you say, it's, it's, it's difficult to legislate. It's better if everybody could take responsibility for it. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Because legislation is obviously important and the legislation is updated in terms of the, the plants that fall under the legislation. But as I said, my particular interest is in raising public awareness and that was the the main reason for the University of Reading exhibiting at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show last year was raising awareness of the problem of invasive species among gardeners and it went down very well. Um, as a topic, gardeners were very interested in, in the topic and their role as gardeners in reducing the risk associated with invasive species. What was the garden that you had at Chelsea last year? So at Chelsea, we had an, an exhibit called Ornamental Plants, Our Future Invaders, which is essentially a summary of my PhD. And this formed part of my PhD project. And this is in the Discovery Zone of the Average Chelsea Flower Show. And the Discovery Zone is where visitors can engage and learn about horticultural research. So for this, we were awarded a, a gold medal. And the main element of the exhibit was a wooden fabrication of a plant called giant rhubarb, the Gunnera tinctoria, which is invasive in parts of Ireland, as I said. Now, in the shadow of this wooden structure, I planted a selection of popular ornamental plants. Some of these were invasive, others not. And this combination of invasive and non-invasive ornamental plants helped me explain the invasion process, how ornamental plants escape gardens and grow in the wild, and to help me explain, we had beautiful interpretation material, including leaflets and, and interpretation boards. These were designed by undergraduate students at the Department of Typography and Graphic Communication at the University of Reading. We distributed two and a half thousand leaflets and probably engaged with seven and a half to ten thousand visitors during Chelsea Week. And there's a huge amount of interest in the issue of invasive plants and the role of gardeners in in that issue not only in responsible gardening but also the choice of plants and so on so which ornamental plants have the potential to be invasive um i guess now and under future climate scenarios that you might particularly like to highlight to listeners a, a beautiful question and that's the main challenge of my phd so that's what i'm looking at at the moment and uh, of course it's not just me looking at this um to measure invasive potential is um, is very difficult um, because there are so many factors involved. The stage I'm at at the moment, I've been engaging with gardeners across the British Isles and over 800 gardeners have completed the survey for me, which had a very simple question. The question was, which or what is the main ornamental plant that you've noticed invading or taking over your garden? So very quickly, the premise for that was if a gardener observes a plant showing invasive behavior, if you wish, and that plant escapes and shows the same behavior in the wild, then it could potentially be classed as an invasive species having a detrimental impact. So that survey gave me a list of ornamental plants of interest for me to look at further and to look at whether they've got invasive potential. There are two ways I'm currently looking at trying to measure invasive potential and, and thus have a short list, if you wish, of of plants that we need to look at. One is a method called species distribution modeling. And this quite simply finds a relationship between where the plant grows currently, both in the British Isles, but I could look globally. So finding a relationship between where the plant is growing and the current climate. And by using that relationship, then the method can project uh, into the future, depending on different climate scenarios, it can project areas, geographic areas, that might be suitable for that plant to grow in the future. So if we're looking at a known invasive plant 
uh, perhaps Japanese knotweed, for example, by using that method, you can map which parts of the British Isles might become more or less suitable for the plant in the future. So that's one method of trying to understand invasive potential. But on its own, it has limitations. So another approach also is an approach called trait-based. Um, and this trait-based approach essentially tries to identify characteristics or traits of a plant that make make that plant more likely to be invasive. And it can be a, a combination of traits. And there's a lot of research being done using this approach. But theoretically, if you can identify it, uh, a combination of traits that increase the invasive potential of a plant, you could then combine that method with the species distribution modeling to try and measure that invasive potential from different different perspectives. Um, but as I said, it's a very, very, very difficult question to answer and it's becoming a very, very dynamic and busy field of research globally, um, me- measuring invasive potential. Could you also, I, mean, I think obviously you're, we spoke before and your work is ongoing, yeah. um, but from that you you can potentially tell which plants might become a problem in the future as well. So have you got any conclusions about that or is that still part of the ongoing research? So at the moment, I've got the list of plants from the survey I mentioned. So that's a survey where 800 gardeners have given me plants that they deem problematic in their gardens. Um, There's probably 150 ornamental plants that have been reported in that survey. And I can give you the top three, which I'm looking at. I'm, mm, looking, at the, I'm looking at the full list, of course. But the top three are very interesting when we're looking at invasive potential. So the f- most commonly reported is Japanese anemone, anemone hybridam, followed by ladies' mantle, Alcamilla mollis. And then the third most commonly reported plant is Mombrisia, Cocosmia, Cocosmifolora. Now, Due to pure luck, these sequence or the top three are very interesting when we're looking at how ornamental plants escape and potentially become invasive. So if I can es- explain, Japanese anemone is not naturalized, or at least not widely naturalized, and that, uh, and I don't know of it self-reproducing in the wild. So that Japanese anemone is an example of a plant that has not naturalized of ornamental origin. Ladies' mantle, on the other hand, has naturalized, and you find it in the wild, in the British Isles. So that's an example of a plant that has escaped the garden fence, if you will, and it self-reproduces in the wild. The third example, then, Mombrisia, is regarded as an invasive species, not necessarily throughout the British Isles, but I come from North Wales. It's certainly problematic as an invasive species in hedgerows and so on. In North Wales, it loves the conditions up there. So that's an invasive species that originally escaped the garden, naturalised, and then had a detrimental ecological impact. So those top three plants from the survey illustrate quite nicely the process of plants escaping. So those are the sort of uh, plants I'm looking at further. Using those two methods, I mentioned the species distribution modelling, the trait-based approach. So hopefully... Short, having a short list, essentially, of ornamental plants of high risk in the future. Actually, three things struck me when you were talking there. The first one, I suppose, is well, it's a two-parter. Is it more likely that a plant is likely to establish in the wild if it has a near relative already in the landscape? And if it does, is that plant more likely to fit into an ecosystem in a positive way because it's similar to an, a plant that's already native to the British Isles? Uh, that question I'm not too sure about because if it has a, a near native, if you if you wish, um, depending on how closely they're related, then of course that plant might be more suited uh, to climate, for example, and fit in to the wider ecological system more easily and naturalize. But the the main, arguably the main step for naturalizing is whether or not that plant um, can spread. So of course, that's reliant upon being able to reproduce, self-reproduce, either vegetatively or by seed. And of course, 
depending on how the plant reproduces, by it, by when there's vegetably or by seed, that has an impact on how quickly a plant can naturalize um, and spread. Uh, yeah, and it also struck me that that it seems to be the most problematic plants are the ones which spread underground. Um, I mean, Crocosmia, if anybody's had that in their garden, they know what an absolute nightmare it is to try and get it out of the soil. Yep. Um, ditto Japanese anemone, which will reproduce from, from roots. Um, and anything like that, like the Japanese knotweed, anything that can reproduce via runners or or bulbs or tubers actually seems to be maybe the most problematic to deal with in terms of removal i don't know whether that's true or not but but it seems as if it could be Uh, it could well be true it's the same i share the same perception and those are the sort of traits that can be looked at using that trait based approach so looking at a characteristic of a plant and which characteristic increases the probability of it becoming invasive so when we're looking at plants that spread vegetatively, of course, as you say, they, they can be very problematic in gardens. If we look at Mambrisia again, um, does spread vegetatively. And in North Wales, I've seen it myself where a gardener, this is going back to raising public awareness of the issue, throwing Mambrisia over the fence into a wild patch um, does not necessarily mean that will compost down. If the conditions are correct, it will probably thrive. And that's perhaps how Mambrisia has spread so widely uh, in North Wales. It's false understanding that the plant might just compost down if it's thrown over the fence. But uh, Mambrisia is a good example of, because I've seen it myself, of how that doesn't happen. And that, that's a, a mode of being introduced in the wild. And you could, on that basis, have repeated introductions into the wild using the same practice. Yeah, that's very true. So obviously gardeners need to be very aware of what they're doing. Is there anything that they can be doing to help with any further research maybe that you're doing or that anybody else is conducting? Yes, and um, of course here I will point out that the the vast majority of gardeners are responsible responsible gardeners. It's small practices such as this that we need to raise the awareness of. Gardeners are always encouraged to participate or engage with my research and I I try my very best to share it online uh, doing podcasts such as this or blogs for example giving talks Uh, I I very much enjoy giving talks to gardening groups because always after giving a talk you're I'm I'm given very difficult questions that might I might not necessarily be able to answer on the spot but I very much enjoy then catching up or following up on those questions afterwards not only can gardeners engage in research such as this, try and engage with their local gardening groups or even the Royal Horticultural Society, of course, but then there are small steps you can take in the garden. And I've used the example of the Mont Brisha. But if we look at invasive species, it's the choice of plants that we have in the garden. So firstly, looking at do we need to have an invasive plant in the garden still? Or could we look at alternatives? Failing that, if we have an, an invasive ornamental plant growing in the garden, many of these are beautiful. That's why they've been introduced initially. Small steps such as deadheading the plant before it goes into seed, for example, again reduces the risk associated with that plant. So there are many small steps that gardeners can take. And just casting a gaze into your crystal ball, do you think the way that we garden will change in the future as a result of threats to our ecosystems? So perhaps maybe we'll have less plants imported or there will be a smaller range available or even that we might ban certain species. Do you think Do you think we will have to change our gardening practices? I think undoubtedly we'll have to change, mainly because of climate change. So that could be, um, if we go back to legislation, I mentioned that the, the list of plants, invasive plants that fall under legislation is updated. And that's important to update the list of plants, banned plants, so that it reflects current data and current evidence. And that, of course, means that we might lose a few plants from our choice if they fall under legislation. But of course, at the very beginning, I mentioned that we had 78,000 different ornamental plants in the British Isles, including all the different varieties and cultivars and so on. So it's not as if we've got a limited choice to experiment with. And in the future, if we're being optimistic, 
Um, I am a gardener, so uh, there is bias here perhaps, but if we're looking at climate change, it gives us an opportunity to grow plants that have so far been struggling, perhaps because of rising average winter minimum temperatures, for example. We might be able, especially in the south, to be able to experiment with new ornamental plants, of course, carefully, so that we consider whether they have invasive potential or not. But there's also a positive side to to change. And also practices, of course, there are wider implications when it comes to changing gardening practices in the future. That also includes pests and diseases, buying British grown plants where possible, of course, and also issues such as sustainable water use and so on. There's a huge list of factors that we need to consider when it comes to a changing climate. And of course, those will then have an impact on how we garden. As always, a huge thank you to today's guest, Thomas Jones. You can find the link to Thomas's blog in the show notes. Thanks to you too for listening. And don't forget, if you're enjoying the podcast, please do share it with others who you think might be interested. If you can't support me on Patreon or sling me a few quid on GoFundMe, and I do get it, sometimes the pennies are tight, it's the next best thing that you can do to help me out, along with giving me a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'll catch you all next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.